Chapter 23, Henley Service Station, Route 66, Gallup, New Mexico, Friday afternoon, July 26th, 1963, 2.45 p.m. With the Impala parked diagonal to the gas station, Jack's mouth forever flapped inside the phone booth. Several times he pounded on the plexiglass with his closed fist. Every time we get near Jack's trunk, he gets nervous, she said. Patch looked out at the black and white Texas license plates. Then he lifted his shiny thirty-eight. I didn't mean you had to shoot him. If he doesn't shut up, I may just pop him. Then his smile drifted away. He stared at the gun and realized once again Roselli's assignment was dangerous. She pushed him toward the door. Let's get a Coke in the machine. Patch extended both arms into the air as he stepped onto the gritty sand. Jack's voice carried in the warm New Mexico air. Patch wandered over toward his car. The Oldsmobile 88 had a large chrome bumper and pointed rocket red taillights. Patch squatted down and ran his fingers along the chrome 88 emblem below the trunk on the left. He slid his finger in the crack and the trunk moved up slightly. Inside the expanse, were dozens of rifles, a few automatic weapons, and wood ammunition boxes. Patch immediately pushed the truck back to its original position and spun around. Did he see you, Patch? I don't think so. He's pretty upset on the phone. What is he doing with all those guns? Guns for money, said Patch in a low voice. They walked up to the red and white Coke machine in the shade of the stucco station. Patch pulled out enough change to cover three bottles of Coke. As if he were playing the slots, he deposited the quarters. Each Coke had a distinctive tumbling sound as the green bottle slid to the bottom of the machine. She removed the bottles one by one and gave them to Patch. He flipped off the caps on the side opener and handed one of the cold bottles to Sherry. Thanks, Patchy. Don't mention it, he said, opening his bottle. In the hot sun, he let the cold, sweet caramel liquid bubble down his dry throat. He wiped his sweaty forehead with the bottle. Man, it's hot out here. She dabbed a tissue on his brow. There. Thanks. Patch checked his watch. Jack had been in the telephone booth for 15 minutes. He held the last bottle and started toward the booth. What's so important to be on the phone all this time? Judging by what's in the trunk, I'd say he has a lot to talk about. Did you see the way he looked at McWillie back in Las Vegas? Like he idolizes him. Patch took another swig and panned the long highway stretch beyond the booth. He probably does. McWillie is a big deal Vegas guy. What about Jack? she asked, grinning. What about him? laughed Patch. They lingered near the booth long enough to hear Jack call someone a rotten son of a bitch. Then Jack slammed down the phone and kicked open both doors. His white shirt was unbuttoned and the sleeves were rolled up. He tucked the shirt in his dark trousers. His handgun was strapped in a leather side holster. Stupid morons. They should be lucky they're even working. You all right, Jack? asked Patch as he handed him the moisture-dripped glass bottle. Thanks, Patchy. He took a big sip and coughed. The cough blended into words. Yeah, just a little labor trouble. That was my second call. Listen, your man, Oswald, is now in New Orleans. Why? His face contorted as if it were still in the booth and he was still angry and then he jammed his finger into Patch's shoulder. Stop asking your questions. It'll only get you into trouble. I understand. Good. Sherry took a sip of Coke. You should be wearing that thirty-eight I gave you. I gave you the strap. Somebody shoots at you. It's not going to do you any good if your piece is lying on the back seat. Patch nodded as he finished the Coke. Jack looked down the road as he tilted the Coke bottle but he spoke before he drank. Come on, Lemon and Lime, let's get off the reservation. Chapter 24 Egyptian Lounge Restaurant, Dallas, Texas, Saturday, July 27, 1963, 11.17 a.m. With Sherry asleep on his shoulder, Patch followed Jack's Oldsmobile into the parking lot of the Egyptian Lounge Restaurant. He shut off the car in front of a sign for extra parking under the light pole. The neon restaurant sign covered the white and palace seats with a magenta hue. Shari, 
her head on his shoulder, opened her eyes wide and yawned. Where are we, Patch? We crossed Dallas on the highway. Jack patted his dog in the front seat of the 88. He closed the door and started toward the restaurant. Opening the restaurant door, Jack motioned with quick head nods for them to come inside. Patch looked into Sherry's brown eyes. I thought we'd be at a hotel by now. I can't even keep my eyes open. Jack waited at the door. Come on, come on. Who are we talking to, Jack? You listen to me, Patchy. You keep your mouth shut around Mr. Campisi. He shrugged his shoulders at Sherry. Even after midnight, the music played through the speakers. Garlic and unidentifiable spices inundated the tiny restaurant. A few people sat around tables to his right. Like a moth drawn to a porch light bulb, Jack gravitated to a booth along the opposite wall. Seated at the booth was a man with dark hair so thick that the comb marks were visible on the sides. He had a straight set of teeth and piercing black eyes. The man looked over his shoulder at Patch. Again, Jack motioned with short, jerky movements. Patch placed his hand on Sherry's back and guided her across the room. A waiter with a pot belly appeared with two glasses of chilled water. An older woman wearing a white apron slid sliced scala bread on the linen tablecloth. The bread's freshly baked essence drifted through the air. Campisi put on his reading glasses and checked something off on a typed invoice. Then the woman removed it from the table. Only moments later, the bartender carried two heaping ceramic dishes of steaming lasagna. Campisi and Jack crossed the restaurant. Campisi stopped at the bar and briefly extended his hand to the little grunt with short hair above the ears and a bald scalp. Jack nodded his head as Campisi spoke. Then he disappeared into the back room. The bald guy pressed his wide lips and held Jack by the arm. I want to know the whole story, Jack. Jack flung his elbow and let the man go. Just shut up. We don't need to know anything right now. Maybe I should get written instructions from them. Jack pointed a fork at him as he spoke. They'll tell you exactly what to do when they tell you, Jerry. It's undetermined as of this time. You leave them out of this. Sherry nibbled on the lasagna for the first time. What's the big picture, Jack? Jack tossed the fork onto the counter. Listen, I'm sick and tired, and I'm heading back to my apartment. See me at the club later in the week. Jerry stared at Jack and released his grip. Then he exited out the front door. Patch raised his brows. He cut the lasagna as Sherry lifted the pasta on her fork. A short time later, Jack sidetracked over to Patch and Sherry. Patchy, the Beachcomber Motel is right down the street. You have rooms. This is good food, said Patch. Right. Listen, Patchy, they'll have the recorder and the rest of the crap here in a second. There'll be some expense money there, too. You just do what they tell you to do. And let me be the first to tell you. If they think you're screwing this up, they'll have somebody else do the job. And that won't bode well for either of you. You're on board now. If you try and back out of this, they'll blow your heads off. Patch looked up with a serious face. Two younger guys carried a two-by-three-foot cardboard box from the back room. Patch thanked him as they set the box on the table. Jack slapped the top of the box. Merry Christmas. He ripped open the side flap. In the center, wrapped in plastic, was an Edison portable reel-to-reel -reel recorder. The Bakelite handheld microphone and cord was stored in the upper half of the case. Just keep the batteries fresh. It's portable. Patch lifted a dozen fresh three-and-a-half-inch tapes from a red plastic bag below. Nifty. In the newspaper packing was a long perforated pole with a set of glossy black headphones. You listen with this and you record by hooking it into the recorder. Jack removed a camera from the box. It had a matte reflex 35 millimeter camera. The box to the right was labeled film. Jack took out another lens for long distance. The last item in the box was a plain manila envelope. Jack handed it to Patch. I was told to keep my nose out of the envelope. Jack spun around toward the kitchen. Patch ripped open the side and pulled out a sheet of yellow bond paper with a typewritten address. Under the 3 by 5 black and white photograph revealed a clean-cut man with a lip smile and an open-collared white shirt. No more than 20 years old, he had a crop of fluffy brown hair and buzzy eyes. Sherry looked over Patch's shoulder as he studied the paper. Be at the West 6th Street Bridge, Pease Park, 
1 Kingsbury Street, Austin, Texas, 4 p.m., July 27, 1963. Meet Dan Wilson. Lee Oswald, the communist, said Patch in a low voice. He looks like an average guy to me. Patch felt a stack of bills inside the envelope. He slid out another wad of hundreds. Oh boy, how much? He counted quickly and spoke under his breath. Looks like another two grand. This just keeps getting weirder and weirder. She looked into his eyes and rested her chin on her folded hands. You've got your two grand, Patchy. Capiche? Capiche. Chapter 25 West 6th Street Bridge, Pease Park, Austin, Texas, July 27, 1963, 3.56 p.m. Patch leaned against the stone bridge's double rail fence. A slight breeze broke the sizzling Texas sun. He wiped his brow on his Hawaiian shirt sleeve. He slept soundly in the adjacent room at the Beachcomber Motel outside of Dallas. The dark car did not appear in his dreams. I was looking at the map. There's a whole stretch of beach along Galveston. I heard there was a god-awful hurricane there around the turn of the century. The beach got wiped out. Houses out to sea. Looks beautiful on the map picture and cooler. She held both his hands and looked up. Somebody has selectively erased your memory. My personal memory. Right. They held hands as they turned back toward the stream. I keep asking myself what these people are up to and if they have anything to do with what happened in my memory. Oswald is being watched by someone else with a vested interest. Whatever we observe will help that vested interest. Well, what would Bond do? She opened her eyes and then gripped the fence as she employed her British accent. Sleep it off. Oh, really? asked Patch with a sly grin. His smile dropped as a short man in a white shirt and dark tie walked deliberately toward the bridge. This must be Wilson. He must be used to the heat with that tie on. Wilson moved closer and adjusted his black rimmed glasses. He gave a quick nod and his smile trailed upward. I'm Dan Wilson. I'm waiting for Arcacia Smith. But he hasn't arrived yet. I'm the go-to attorney for Coop Attorney in Wyndham. You are Lemon and Lime from Dallas. Nice to meet you, said Pat, shaking his hand. Wilson nodded at Sherry. Ma'am, Dallas isn't as hostile as an environment as people say. Mr. Cooper just talked to the mayor this morning. Even the president is coming to Dallas in November. Great, said Patch, wiping his brow again. I'm sure our meeting has to do with the Oswald surveillance. Yes, it does. You have the photograph? Yes, sir, said Patch, taking out the wallet. I have an updated photo. Patch handed him the picture of the fluffy-haired man. Wilson placed another tiny black-and-white photo in Patch's hand. This photo is current. And by the way, this will be the only time you'll meet me. Wilson now faced the river and placed his hands on the bridge rails. I'm here to give you a few ground rules. Yours is a singular operation for which you will be well paid. Apparently your background is well spoken for, Lemon. You will send, via the three-and-a-half-inch tapes, a concise and accurate verbal report of the surveillance of Lee Oswald. Do not, and I repeat, do not operate outside that parameter. Stay away from Oswald. Do not let him know you are there. I would ask also that you not deal with Jack. He has accomplished his job. If there's any trouble, meaning if your lives are threatened or your cover is blown, you will immediately call your original contact, whoever that is. Get out a notebook. Sherry held out a pen and a tiny black notebook. Do not arrive in New Orleans until the evening of August 1st. The following morning, your envelope will appear at the Lafayette Square station in the government building. Box assigned to you is P.O. Box 300543, listed under L. Lime. You might spot Oswald at some point because he has a box there. Again, do not let Oswald know you're watching him. How long will Oswald be under surveillance, asked Sherry. As long as the money shows up, unless something dramatic develops. When you mail those tapes, do not include a return address. Send them to Cooper, Tierney, and Wyndham, Box 13, here in Austin. I have it, said Sherry, as she wrote down the remaining numbers. Mr. Cooper is not to be involved in any way. I don't know who he is. Just as well. Never call Cooper, Tierney, and Wyndham. Call your original contact with any problems. You'll have a local contact in New Orleans. Any questions? They shook their heads in unison. 
drive to your P.O. Box in New Orleans on Friday, 2nd of August at 11 a.m. in the morning. Use the lemon and line names with your contact. We will, said Patch. What do we do in the meantime? Not my concern. Please wait here for Senor Arcacia Smith and Mr. Barker. Good luck. Patch shook his hand. We'll get it done, ma'am. Wilson turned slowly and went back across the bridge. The breeze picked up, cooling the sweat on Patch's brow. Wilson rounded the tree clump at the river's edge. Who are these men, Patch? I don't know either of them. Patch wiped his brow. Sure is hot out here. Patch, what do you think this surveillance of Lee Oswald is all about? Patch looked back down along the road. Well, somebody wants to follow the guy and get reports on him. Maybe they just want to see if he's doing what they think he's doing. That would mean that what he's doing is a part of something else, something bigger. She locked her arm around his and they started back to the ever-moving stream. Patch felt secure with her touch. You are a lemon? Asked a deep voice from behind. He doesn't look like a lemon, said a dapper, dark-haired man with a Spanish accent. He shook Patch's hand. Unless he's come from Cuba, I have not. Prove it. A man shorter than Patch with pinpoint dark eyes and hair flapped over his head ground his teeth together. The man says he wasn't in Cuba. Mr. Barker? He said, still unsure if this man was Barker. Kincaid. He glanced at Arcacia Smith. I have made some calls. Mr. Traficanti is convinced you have not been in Cuba for the past year and a half. And frankly, that is irrelevant to him and me. I am here for one reason. It's the same reason why I left Batista with my family to go to Miami. We know you didn't open your mouth about Carlos Sanchez, and then you and your professor friend tracked him down and killed him. We all think you have balls, Kincaid. I know that Mr. Traficante does, too. That took some doing, added Arcacia Smith. I appreciate your confidence. After Sanchez died, we had the missile crisis. The world is an unsafe place. You're probably asking yourself, what is this tracking of Oswald all about? I've thought about it. Only natural. During the war, I was a bombardier on board a B-17 flying fortress. I ended up in Starlock Loof 1 when we crashed. Sixteen months later, the Russians opened up a camp and we were all free. I learned to accept a lot of things and keep my mouth shut. Just remember that when you're following Oswald. Don't ask questions. You're getting paid to do what you do. He squeezed Patch's hand tightly. Let's keep the world safe. We need to do what we need to do. The many are more important than the one. Patch nodded. Barker and Arcacia Smith left without saying anything to Sherry. They walked together in the opposite direction from Wilson. A hundred feet down the road, they walked by a 1959 blue Chevy. The dark-haired man behind the wheel set down a pair of binoculars. Who the hell is he? As Patch moved with Sherry down the road, the car engine started, but the guy did not drive away as they approached the open window. He wore a light blue shirt and sipped on a bottle of Dr. Pepper. Howdy, said Patch, looking at the binoculars on the vinyl seat. Can I help you? Gee, I don't know. If I were a suspicious guy, I'd think you were spying on us. I like to watch the birds along the river, all the way from North Carolina. I have relatives here in Austin. Well, have a nice trip back, said Patch as they walked along the car. Sherry opened her eyes intensely as she stared at him. Patch saw the dealership name in chrome, which was attached above the rear bumper. He waited till they were further down the road. Woolsey Chevrolet, Nags Hill, North Carolina. Maybe he is watching the birds. Let me be honest with you, Patch. I'm scared. I have a bad feeling about all of this. She unwrapped a foiled juicy fruit. Maybe I'm making more of that guy than I need to. Oh, and Patch, there was a sticker on those binoculars. Like an official sticker like a company might put on something they own. Really? OP921E2. Now get his tag number, 101-81939. Patch placed his hands on her shoulders. Why do I now feel this is more important than we thought? Because it is. Chapter 26, Galveston Island, Texas. 
July 27, 1963, 7.15 p.m. Shorebird soared above the high wispy clouds and the silver churning waves disappeared into the milky sand. The last burst of sunshine penetrated a panoply of lengthy orange and steely clouds above the horizon. Patch aimed a long amplifier tube 50 yards down the beach at Sherry next to the blanket. Say something! He adjusted the headphones, but when he lifted the left pad, he could barely hear a voice in the air. The top piece seemed detached from the rest of the amplifier. Patch snapped the piece back in place. After a slight buzz, the sounds of the breakers as well as the wind filled the headphones. Say something! You want me to say that I like you a lot, Patch? She asked in a soft voice. Patch had no trouble understanding her this time. He slowly smiled and trotted back up the beach. She stood with a coke in her hand in the sand at the edge of the blanket. This amplifier, the sun glistened on her white teeth. Still not working, eh? Patch set the amplifier and headphones in the case. Her dark eyes were heightened in the dreamy sunset. He placed his fingers on her cheeks. I heard every word you said. Oh no, she said, jumping back. I like you too. He took her hand and they sat on the blanket. The waves moved slowly to the shore as if guided by some unknown power as the sunlight split between the lingering clouds. Pat shielded his eyes. I don't know who's running this Rosselli operation or who's stuffing the envelope with money, but this is the first time since I woke up on those rocks that I feel safe. I have a saying. Oh, and what might that be? It's bad luck to see an owl in the sunlight. I don't think we have to worry about that on the beach. What I'm saying, it, maybe it's just as well we don't know who's paying us, she said. I don't think it's the law firm in Austin. Patch put her arm around her cotton jersey. Oswald is doing something Rosselli's crowd is interested in, that's for certain. I'm not sure they hope to gain by his actions. She rested her head on his shoulder. I think you hit on something, Patchy. Why are the movements of this guy so important to anyone? A big operation? He squinted in the sun's rays. Maybe he's going to steal something. Look at the sun, the waves, the sand. It's beautiful. He turned and caught sight of her wide eyes. Then he lifted her hair off her cheek. In the Vegas hotel, he had kissed her because he was genuinely glad to see her return. Now it was different. Something transcended the surveillance. As he thought about it all, he kissed her again. I came back because I was worried, because I wanted to help. But I had this feeling about being around this man with no memory. I don't think I had that feeling when I gave you a ride to the border. Patch laughed. That was your first mistake. No, my first mistake was letting you inside the theater. True. She stood and held out her hand. Patch got on his feet. Come on, let's take a walk on the beach. The soft sand pushed between his toes as they followed the shadows away from the blanket. You were curious about me. Second mistake. Right. He slipped his arm around her again. I think you're right about my being involved in intelligence. The way Rosselli said he and his friends owe you. For what? The same with Barker. Saying how you and this Mankiewicz tracked down Sanchez. I assume he's one of the bad guys. But you command a great deal of respect from these people, or they wouldn't have put you in the position you're in. They feel you can keep tabs on Oswald from a distance. They stopped and held each other as the sun sank below the ocean's edge. They turned and started back. They want to know he's doing what he's supposed to do. Or have actual proof. We have the equipment. I need some additional training. She looked up and smiled. Having a little technical problem, are we? Be nice. I'm the one with the money now. Patch grabbed her hand again and they ran back along the beach. At the blanket, he scooped up the Edixa camera. He snapped several pictures of her posing dramatically, with tilting her head back and staring with her deep, vivid eyes. She sat on his chest and took a shot of him sticking out his tongue. They rolled onto the blanket. He kissed her and he did not stop caressing her in the twilight. Her soft body moved sensually over him like an all-encompassing force. As darkness swept across the beach, he merged with her and all his troubles seemed to vanish within her love. Patch spent hours familiarizing himself with the linear black sound amplifier 
connected to the amp with a little tape recorder. All the answer chromes color slides they had taken in Galveston were segregated from the Texas mailing. He placed the red and yellow 35 millimeter canister into its aluminum case and stored it in a separate leather pouch. Sherry lay on the blanket reading a James Bond book. Patch sipped on his coffee. Didn't you already read Dr. No? No? I thought, she smiled, I meant yes, no. She set down the paperback and pecked him on the lips. I wonder what would happen if we didn't show up Friday in New Orleans. Patch made a shaky gesture with his hands. Whoa, whoa. Mr. Rosselli would then make a phone call, need I say any more? Well, I figure this will last a few weeks at most, Patchy. Would you like to come back and see Spokane once we're done? I mean, more than just the milk bottle. What about Ricky Blaze? She hesitated. He's gone. What are you going to do? Straighten out my life. Have somebody pull a few strings and to maybe substitute teach. Patch looked over the breakers. How difficult can it be to watch some guy and take pictures? The word is dangerous, not difficult. Or they wouldn't be flocking over the cash. Exactly. Ever been to New Orleans? Nope. All I know about New Orleans is Mardi Gras and jazz. And Creole food. And don't forget Fats Domino. He lay back with her on the blanket and they looked up at the high-moving clouds. I need to get to a doctor when this is over and unlock my head. I'm sorry, I forgot, sweetness. That's my line, he said. He held her hand. What about Sanchez? What if his buddies know I'm around? She sat up. They won't know if we stay in the background and we should be able to. Patch nodded. I had the dream again last night. That dark car heading into trouble across the prairie. You didn't tell me. Nothing you can do about it. She held him. You tell me, Patch. Patch smiled and had her juicy fruit pack in his hand. Gum? Don't mind if I do, she said, taking out a foil wrap piece. How long's the drive to New Orleans? I haven't even checked. About six hours. If we leave early, we can be at that post office by 11 a.m. He shook his head. What's the matter? Like when I have the repeating dream, Sherry. Impending doom. Chapter 27 Lafayette Square, New Orleans, Louisiana, Friday morning, August 2nd, 1963, 10.57 a.m. By mid-morning, they had parked the Impala near the post office adjacent to a city park. They walked through an assortment of sweet-smelling flowers and passed under a bronze statue of Henry Clay. As if he were making a debating point atop a stone pedestal, Clay's hand extended outward toward the blue sky. The Great Compromiser, said Sherry. Why is it I can remember Henry Clay and nothing about my life? Because they aren't threatened by Henry Clay, she said as they continued along the dirt walkway toward the street. Whoever played with your mind was threatened by you, Patch. I can't even tell you about my childhood. If you want my opinion, it'll all come back to you. They can't block that stuff forever. The map designated the post office as the massive stone building across the busy street. They rounded a garden display and stepped toward the columns under a huge flapping American flag. With tremendous trepidation, he climbed with her up the stone stairs. Then he pulled open the heavy doors. The voluminous federal building smelled of ink and varnish oak. Wide, grainy brown floor panels were glossed to a spit shine. The brass rim post office boxes formed a wall straight ahead and to the right of the counter. Each box had a tiny window with gold and black stenciled shadowed numbers. The dark numbered wall clock neared 11 a.m. As they passed the oak tables and wide windows, a man with scruffy eyebrows and a brown touring cap rounded the corner. He wore white pants as if he worked in a fast food restaurant. He grabbed Patches up around with a sense of recognition. Patch Kincaid, you're alive. I'm Lemon, who are you? Right, your code. He extended his hand to Sherry and then turned to Patch. I'm Dave, Dave Ferry, for Christ's sake. Well, I went by the name of Easterly two years ago, Harold Easterly. You know Patch? Know him? He placed his hand on the side of his mouth and lowered his voice. I flew him into Cuba during the Bay of Pigs, and now I'm supposed to refer to him as Mr. Lemon. I'm aware of the name substitution. Ferry handed Patch a tiny brass key. P.O. Box 300543, said Patch, studying the etched numbers. 
We all have our required duties. Thanks, David. Ferry nodded. He took two steps toward the outside door and abruptly spun around. You know, they all swore to God you were executed in Cuba after the invasion. God love you, Pat. You fooled them all. With his last words, he marched around the floor panels. He pushed open the doors. Pat saw him look left and then right down the street as the doors closed. Another piece of your big puzzle, Patch. Weren't there government intelligence agencies involved in the Bay of Pigs? Yep. She nodded and followed the numbered brass boxes down the wall. Then she gestured with her open hand. 300543. Patch, still confused about Ferry flying into Cuba, backed up to the box and inserted the brass key. He opened the tiny door and pulled out a single crisp manila envelope with a typewritten white label, lemon and lime. Interesting. He tore open the envelope with his index finger. Ten $100 bills with Benjamin Franklin again staring at him lay flat on a sheet of heavyweight yellow paper. The instructions were simple. Meet Eladio del Valle, La Petite Fleur, 9 p.m., August 2, 1963. What's this all about? And who's this guy, DeValley? Could be anyone. Patch fanned the bills. I don't like the way this is going. She held the money and grinned. Well, it's not that bad. A lot of cash. He shook his head. This is strange. You are a threat to the intelligence people. Rosselli said not to go near the intelligence guys, and now here's this fairy character saying he personally flew you into Cuba during the Bay of Pigs fighting two years ago. Patch locked the box. He mumbled as he placed the key under the plastic picture holder in his wallet. I don't remember a damn thing about it. I can't let them know I don't know anything. I have to go through with this. These people play for keeps. La Petite Fleur, 675 Canal Street, New Orleans, Louisiana, Friday night, August 2nd, 1963, 9 p.m. Patch turned up the radio as he drove under the electric rail car lines. On the international stage, Kim Philby is a double agent, according to Investia in Radio Moscow. At the beginning of July, Britain confessed Philby was the third man in the Burgess and McLean Soviet spy ring. Where's James Bond when you need him, asked Patch. Bond would have found Philby out years ago. In the People's Daily, the People's Republic of China condemned the Soviet Union as being freaks and monsters for allowing unconditional concessions and capitulation to the imperialists. The Red Chinese were, of course, talking about the partial nuclear test ban treaty with the United States and the United Kingdom. I knew that treaty would cause problems, she said. He checked all the little shops and cafes as he searched for La Petite Fleur. What about Kennedy? I'm sure the power makers don't like the fact that we're in bed with the Russians. Beware, New Orleans. Hurricane Arlene is off the coast of Bermuda with an uncertain trajectory. WNOE will keep you advised. And now back to Ron Bracken and the Tops and Pops here on WNOI. The next song blasted like a car racing from a dead stop. Patch swung the Impala gingerly to the curb around 100 feet from the corner cafe called La Petite Fleur. A red and green neon flower spread over a thin wooden door that constantly opened and closed. Sherry spoke the words whispered at the beginning of the song. Wipe out? Well, I hope we don't get wiped out. They're talking about a surfer patch. Sometime we'll dance to it. I saw an amusement park by the beach. He nodded, but his face was serious as he stared across the street. Let's go find Diwali. Patch leaned toward her. Nervous? Yes. They slid outside and he locked all the doors. Music from the bar trickled up the sidewalk. A single window had vertical iron bars. The mixture of jazz grew louder and the conglomeration of smoke escaped onto the sidewalk every time the door opened. She hung on his side as he approached the door. It burst open and a little guy in a t-shirt rumbled onto the sidewalk. Inside a gyrating dock man fanned a golden saxophone in the haze. Patrons dotted around the bar and tables like billiard balls on an uneven table. The air was warm and stuffy. Patch led her up to the chubby little man with the red nose behind the bar. I'm looking for Eladio de Valle. The man mixed some gin with tonic water and sneered at Patch. So what? Is he here? Who the hell knows? I don't know who he is. Can you ask somebody? I'm busy. He continued to mix the drink. 
can see this is going to be fun, said Patch as they sidestepped down the bar. He asked the other bartenders about the valley. She spoke over the saxophone's blare. I think we've been had. I know we're dealing with a tight organization. I can't believe that P.O. box message would get messed up. From a booth next to a faded green restroom door, a man with a high forehead and large brown eyes waved him over with his fingers. The little man stood and shook Patch's hand. He shouted over the saxophone. Eladio Tavale. Lemon. Lime. Please sit down. Thank you so much for meeting with me tonight. Patch slid into the booth with Sherry and faced the open call at Diwali. My instruction is to provide local cuddle for you. You are a Cuban? He produced a wide and sustained smile. Then he lit a tipperillo and shook out the match on the old table. Yes, I fled in 1959. I've been back to Cuba with my men last year. Castro and his regime are evil. I feel these things deeply. Now Kennedy has stopped the raids. Have we met before? No. Has your contact met me? No comment. He wrote down a number in blue ink on a white napkin. This is a number. You will call me. Contact me immediately. You will just ask for Vito. Thank you. For what it's worth, my friend, I have no idea what your instructions are. I am only here to protect you. He looked toward the door and around the bar. One more thing. What's that? I was told to tell you that Carlos Sancho's friends must never know you are alive. They will make sure you are dead. Where are his friends? They are in Havana. They will want you dead if they know you're alive. That is the word. Why? He laughed. Jesus! It's because of you Carlos was shot dead. He stood like a soldier and grasped Patch's hand. I hope, my friend, you do not have to call Vito. Patch leaned toward her as Diwali pushed open the Canal Street door and then he was gone. This is becoming way too dangerous. A gray-haired man in a white shirt kicked open the front door. The guy's hair was pushed back and messy. His eyes were intense as he walked along the bar. He spoke to no one. Then he extended his hand. Good to see you again, Patch. I have a message for you. A large pearl-handled handgun was stuffed into a side holster. How do you know my name? Got the innocent routine. I ain't got time for it. The message is, proceed according to plan. Yeah, right. Hey, don't be a wise ass. I don't like bullshit. You got that? I'll whip your ass. Okay. I want you to get a nice hotel downtown. I suggest the Charlemagne, he said, placing five $100 bills in Patch's hand. Call your contact and get him a phone number. Very good things about you since I last saw you. How did we meet? He flipped an orange card to Patch. Cut the shit, Patch. You're a private investigator. You know that, Patch. Don't call me unless you're cornered. As far as you're concerned, I was never here tonight. Not tonight, not tomorrow, never. Understood. One more thing. I was told that you should take a little walk down to Cata Street to the Havana Bar before you go to the hotel. Lee Oswald may be in there. Put that in your report. You didn't hear it from me. Okay. Good luck. He looked at Sherry. Ma'am. Mr. Bannister. Bannister exited the same way he had come into the bar. I honestly don't remember that man. He remembers you. Maybe Cuban intelligence took away your memories. Patch threw back his head and laughed. You're asking me? At the end of the street, a blue 1959 Chevy pulled away from the curb ahead. That's the car in Austin, shouted Patch. Must be a bird preserve nearby, said Sherry. The car turned at the corner and disappeared. We need to have someone trace that plate and find out who this guy is. He raised up his wristwatch. It was 12.35 a.m., the early morning stillness was broken by loud talk and music from the bars ahead. He walked with his arm around Sherry down Decatur Street. People clutched chairs and each other in the low light. The bar on his left was called the Habana Bar. Obviously the bird watcher is working for somebody, she said. Why, because of the number on his binoculars? Sherry nodded as a tall black woman in a white dress, reeking of booze and an overpowering cheap perfume, staggered out and threw her arms around a man smoking a cigarette. 
The guy ripped her arms away. Get lost! She blew a kiss to him in the doorway and then started down the street. Patch thought he saw Oswald inside at one of the tables. He checked his wallet. Sherry looked at the photo they had received in Austin. Oswald. They edged inside the doorway. Oswald sat next to a slightly older Cuban in a sleeveless blue sweater. The Cuban's well-formed biceps bulged in his short-sleeved shirt. He ordered a tequila in Spanish. Oswald quickly drank the tequila when it arrived. Man keeps late hours. With Cubans? Doesn't look like a loner, but he sure looks ill from that drink. Patch held her inside the open door. Somebody brought Oswald a lemonade. Once he finished the lemonade, the group stood at the table. Patch steered back to the street. He quickly backtracked to the Impala with Sherry before Oswald and his friends came outside. They're shelling out thousands to watch a guy who spends his time drinking lemonade and tequila after midnight. This should prove real interesting. Let's get some shut-eye and get back to the P.O. Box in the morning. Chapter 28 Lafayette Postal Annex, New Orleans, Louisiana August 5, 1963, 9.02 a.m. Upon leaving the hotel and all the way downtown, Patch checked the streets for the 1959 Chevy. With the manila envelope in hand, he led Sherry across the street and into the park at Lafayette Square. With birds chirping, they sat on a bench near a statue of Benjamin Franklin. He gazed up at the bald-headed Franklin and then ripped open the envelope. Inside was a larger black-and-white photo of Oswald in a shirt and tie as he handed out leaflets on a street corner. Sherry studied the photo. A little different from the guy in the bar last night. He looks different, clean-cut. The yellow paper pressed between the photograph and an address return envelope to the box in Austin had bold type. Lee Oswald will be handing out more communist pamphlets, but may visit the Bringier Clothing Store at 107 Decatur Street. Check for Oswald and Carlos Bringuer of the DRE. Position yourself as close to the store as possible. Get the pictures and sound. So he is a communist, said Patch. The DRE is an anti-Castro student group. A lot of money being dropped here, Patchy. Patch tucked the papers back in the envelope. I'd like to know who we're really working for. I don't think that's something we're going to find out. Rosselli may just be the contact, or his people could be running this. He stood and put his hand around her and panned the park. Who are the Cubans Oswald was with last night? More communist, Patch. I don't think so. I'm debating whether to call Rosselli about that 59 Chevy. Maybe one of Rosselli's people is watching the birds. The Impala, wedged between a white cube truck and a high fin two-tone green DeSoto, provided an excellent vantage point across the street from Bringier's clothing store. Sherry held a 35mm Edixer as Patch positioned the sound amplifier rod atop the lowered window. For two hours on the headphones, he heard inconsequential conversations of customers, sales clerks, in Spanish and in English. He merely needed to push down the play and record button simultaneously to record the chatter. Here comes Oswald, said Patch. Take his picture. The shutter snapped as Lee Oswald, slight in build and not looking particularly dangerous, simply strolled down the street to the store entrance. Oswald's nose appeared larger from the side, his neck longer, and his hairline was receding. I got five or six pictures. Good. He turned on the chrome reporter, pushed the play and record button. Then he plugged the cord into the amplifier's auxiliary outfit. Let's see if he can talk these guys into becoming communist. Through the headphones, a Cuban man inside the store spoke passionately about his country. Sherry leaned toward the headphone. Talking about $10 invasion bonds. Our fight, my young friend, is a struggle of Cubans. You are a mere youth. You wish I would supply you with the writing of our fight. You can hand out our literature, but I cannot let you into our organization until you are older. Excuse me, is this Cuban headquarters? Yes, I am an ex-Marine. The speaker had a slight lisp or drag to his somewhat passive voice. Perhaps he had an amalgamated accent acquired from several areas of the country. Patch wasn't sure if it was Oswald who was talking with the Cubans. Do you realize what this man, uh, Castro, has done to that tiny island? There's no freedom. 
people are dead. For you see, communism holds no future. This man understands our cause. Do you have some of the literature against Castro? Did you hear that, Patch? What's he up to? Somebody rustled paper inside the store. He's my organization's reporter about Cuba. I think you'll find it very interesting. Thirty seconds silence ensued. Patch watched the reel spin in unison and was about to shut off the recorder when the man he assumed was Oswald spoke again. Listen, I have been in the Marines. I had extensive training in guerrilla warfare. I would volunteer my services to train the Cubans to fight against Castro. I could accompany guerrillas on sabotage missions. I believe this so strongly I volunteer to fight against this dictator. Patch raised his brows and stared outside the door. Is he coming out? She asked. I think so. No, we don't have nothing to do with military activities, sir. I can teach you how to blow up the Huey P. Long Bridge. Patch. What? Sherry's mouth opened. I can put powder charges at the bridge's foundation where the foundation meets the suspension part. I can derail trains, put a chain around the track and lock it, or even homemade explosives like a zip gun. Holy God! She held the camera and shook her head. The Cuban nervously laughed. No, no, no. My, my only duties here in Orange are to propaganda and information, no military activities. Patch handed the headphones to Sherry. Listen while I turn over the reels. Just before the tape ended, he stopped the machine and flipped over the Mylar tape so the upper half now hit the recording head. Most of the next 30 minutes involved low-level talk that he found difficult to hear. Only when Oswald tried to give the Cuban money did Patch stop the recording again. Sherry held the headphones so they both could hear. Well, at least let me donate to your people. Senor, I don't accept money for our cause. I, I would need a necessary permit from the city at Hall in New Orleans. So I can't accept your money. Why don't you send the money directly to headquarters in Miami? Here. He said after a short pause, and then he spoke again. Here's the post office box in Miami. How's that? Sure. Now you must go to the bank. Nice talking to you. More than a half a minute later, a man with dark hair and glasses exited the store with a satchel under his arm. Sherry caught his photo several times as he briskly walked down the sidewalk. But Oswald was not done inside the store. I had a military manual when I was in the Marines. I can give it to you. You don't have to. Bring it to Carlos. Okay, next time I come in. Pat shut off the recorder. He took out the amplifier cord and inserted the microphone into the jack. Something isn't right here. This guy is on both sides. He's playing both sides. Then he started the recorder again and spoke into the microphone. Audio recording, three and a half inch reel, August 5th, 1963. This is Lemon. The proceeding was a recording on August 5th, 1963, outside the Bringier's clothing store, 107 Decatur Street, in New Orleans. The American in the conversation was Lee Oswald. We have taken several pictures of Oswald entering the store. He is returning tomorrow with some kind of military book. I will place this tape in the holder and send it to the proper address. For a guy who is supposed to be a communist, this Oswald sounds just the opposite. Double dealing with Bringier of the DRE. Lemon out. Patch pushed the stop and then the FF button tape spun and raced toward the end of the spool. He removed the plastic reel with a sound duly recorded on the tape and placed it back in the container. She held up the return envelope with the Austin address. Patch dropped it inside and Sherry sealed it shut. He started the impaler and gently pulled into traffic. A few blocks away she spotted a red and blue mailbox. Mailbox, Patch. Our man Oswald seems to be working for somebody. I'm sure whoever gets this tape will figure that out. Chapter 29 Canal Street, New Orleans, Louisiana, Friday, August 9th, 1963 The President flew up to Cape Cod on a Jetstar aircraft to be with Mrs. Kennedy and his son Patrick Bouvier Kennedy. The baby was born five and a half weeks premature and delivered by an emergency cesarean section at the Otis Air Force Base Hospital in Falmouth, Massachusetts on Cape Cod. Patrick Bouvier Kennedy has a birth weight of four pounds, ten and a half ounces, and has been transferred to Boston's Children's Hospital. 
She looked over at Patch and opened the newest manila envelope from the post office box in Lafayette Square. Patch removed more money and counted twenty one hundred dollar bills. This must be damned important to somebody. We need to put all this money in a bank somewhere. It'd be safer than carrying it in the suitcase. What's going on with all these Cubans, Patch? Well, he said, starting the car, that's why we have Mr. Oswald under surveillance. What does that say about Oswald? Patch read the contents out loud. There will be an intelligence operative associated with a program called AK slash DEFUN in the area. His name is Clay Shaw. Patch pulled out a small black and white photo of a tall man with wavy gray hair and a dark suit. That's Shaw. Remember, Rosselli said the government wants to nab me, and Shaw is with one of the intelligence agencies. Then we stay away from Shaw. Shaw's working with them, maybe even controlling Oswald. Oswald is handing out leaflets on Canal Street, the 700 block. I'll monitor it and maybe even record it, and then send the tape out to Box 13 in Austin. What about the pictures we've already taken? Oh, yeah. I'll send the film to them once we finish the roll. The Galveston roll? Patch grinned. No, not the Galveston roll. At least Moon is dead, and that's not hanging over us. My question, Sherry, is about Oswald. Besides Shaw, who else is behind all this pretend communist stuff? From the Impala, Patch pointed at Lee Oswald only a few minutes later on Canal Street. Oswald wore, as usual, short sleeve white shirt and dark slacks. He carried some kind of holder for his leaflets. As a passerby would approach, Oswald plucked out a pamphlet from the holder. Can you read what it says on those flyers? asked Patch as he tweaked the sound and prepared the little reel-to-reel recorder. Something about Cuba, she said, balancing the binoculars on the windshield. He was in Bringier's clothing store a few days ago, volunteering his expertise and money to fight Castro. That's not what those flyers say, Patch. It says, hands off Cuba. Do you want me to get one? No, we're supposed to remain out of sight. A woman proceeded up the sidewalk, holding one of the flyers in a purse strap. I take back what I said. That woman has a flyer. I see it. She exited the Impala and approached the woman about 20 feet away. Then she returned to the car with the flyer, and the woman crossed the street. She said she was looking for a trash barrel. This is a definite communist handout, said Patch, holding the flyer in his hand. Free literature and lectures, everyone welcome. I think I'll pass, he said, looking at the pamphlet. Who is A.J. Hiddell? Unknown. Probably a phony name. Just mail it with your tape. Patch studied the smirking Oswald through the binoculars. Patch. 544 Camp Street. That's the same address on Bannister's office card. Patch removed Bannister's card from his wallet holder. So Bannister and Oswald are working together. Here comes trouble. Carlos Bringier from the clothing store and two Latin-looking associates move rapidly toward Oswald. Patch adjusted the headphone, but the street noise made it difficult to hear. Oswald went to shake hands with Bringier, but Bringier shouted in a tirade about how Oswald had just come to his store to fight Fidel Castro. Oswald had given Bringier his Marine Corps training book and now was handing out literature to promote Castro. The confrontation escalated during the next few minutes and Oswald called out to Bringier. If you want to hit me, Carlos, hit me. A short time later, the police arrived and physically removed them all from the street corner. Even after they were gone, Patch stared ahead. He looked at Sherry. Oswald deliberately provoked that disturbance. I'll go back to what you asked, Patch. Is Shaw giving Oswald his instructions? Audio recording, three and a half inch reel, August 9th, 1963. This is Lemon. I'm recording a tape on August 9th, 1963. Today I witnessed an altercation on Canal Street between Lee Oswald and three Latin men led by Carlos Bringier from his clothing store at 107 Decana Street in New Orleans. Oswald offered his support against Castro two days ago and supplied Bringier with a Marine Corps training manual. He also volunteered to train soldiers as well as give money to the cause against Castro. However, today, Oswald handed out to the general public flyers that said, Hands off Cuba, in support of the communist government in Cuba. There ensued a verbal altercation where Oswald asked Carlos to hit him. The police arrived and all parties were taken away. I later met Guy Bannister, a private investigator, 
when I was walking down Canal Street. I mentioned the scuffle, and he said Oswald was with his office. That coincides with his office address written on the flyer, 544 Camp Street. The name A.J. Haddell was stamped above this address. I'll mail the tape out in the morning. Lemon out. Chapter 31 Charlemagne Hotel New Orleans, Louisiana Friday, August 16th, 1963 8.55 a.m. The brass elevator door is closed. Patch pinched the bridge of his nose as they descended. I didn't see who was in the dark car in my dream. It was closer this time. I was in the middle of that storm. Very dark. Wind swirling. And there he was, down the highway. Who? Oswald. In a t-shirt. Just standing there as the car was racing toward him. Then what happened? He was looking the other way. Who was in the car? I don't know. I woke up. She hugged him. Dreams aren't real, Patch. The elevator stopped. Patch and Sherry squeezed through the parting brass doors. For four days, the post office box had been empty, and he worried about whether Del Valley had told him the truth back in Jackson Square. Calls to Del Valley had gone unanswered. Patch picked up a newspaper. The portable TV at the main desk showed a meeting between President Kennedy and the new ambassador to South Vietnam. Jerry slowed down on the marble floor. They stopped in front of the portable TV. Newly appointed ambassador to Vietnam, former vice presidential candidate with Richard Nixon in 1960, Henry Cabot Lodge speaks with President Kennedy in the Oval Office yesterday. High on the agenda is addressing the communist threat in Vietnam. Lodge speaks fluent French and served two tours of duties during World War II. Kennedy is a reasonable man, said Patch. But the Chinese and Russians aren't. On the newspaper's front page, the vice president sat atop a horse at his Texas ranch. In the background, his wife and daughter admired the horse with the smiling former director of the CIA, Alan Dulles. Excuse me, Mr. Kincaid, shouted the clerk with a flat brown toupee. He adjusted his dark suspenders and rounded the corner with an envelope in his hand. This correspondence arrived for you during the night. Patch handed him a dollar and took the white sealed envelope with his name on it. Who left it? Sir, apparently it was left during the night. Around 3 a.m.? I can check with the clerk when he comes back this afternoon. I appreciate it. The clerk nodded and returned to the front desk. Patch put his hand behind Sherry's back and moved past the tall green plants into the sitting room near the outside windows. For a few seconds he stared at the envelope. The penmanship lacked clarity and the envelope looked used. He tore open the edge and pulled out a sheet of paper with the Charlemagne header in green letters up top and a logo of ornate street lamps. The inside writing matched the outside of the envelope. Dear Lemon, you are walking into something you best walk away from. I don't know you and have nothing to gain by telling you the people you are dealing with only care about what they want to accomplish. Sincerely, Pilatus. Pilatus? Sounds like a Roman emperor, Pilatus Maximus. Pat stroked his chin. He's the man on the bench last night. How do you know? I don't. Just a feeling. Lafayette Square Post Office Annex, New Orleans, Louisiana, Friday, August 16th, 1963, 9.35 a.m. After four days, a new Manila envelope appeared in the post office box. Patch quickly opened it at the tables along the other boxes. A slip of yellow type paper was tucked between $50 bills. Patch did not count the money. Lee Oswald will be handing out his communist pamphlets again. Station yourself at the International Trade Mart in New Orleans. Clay Shaw, a paid CIA contract source, is associated with the Trade Mart and is helping Oswald accomplish his goal. 
Oswald was arrested after the last incident and was debriefed by FBI SAC Quigley and SAC De Bruyne. De Bruyne and Oswald have met on many occasions at the Habana Bar. Oswald frequences the Customs House building, specifically with De Bruyne and David Smith and Wendell Roach of the Immigration Service. They all know each other. After the arrest, Oswald went on a New Orleans radio station and debated Bringier and the Exiles as a Marxist. Urgent. Listen to Oswald on WDSUAM after 6 p.m. August 17th. Warning. FBI informant Orville Alcoyne is also filming Oswald. FBI photographers will photograph the incident. Stay clear of Alcoyne and the FBI. Attached is a New Orleans mugshot of Oswald after the street incident. Why is he meeting with the FBI? Oswald's playing both sides, Sherry, and working with the CIA guy, and I don't know why. With Plattis watching him, and us, Patch twisted his lips and shrugged his shoulders. I would say Oswald is gathering information on people and telling the FBI agents. It would appear that way. How is the FBI involved in this? asked Patch in a loud voice. Roselli did say to stay away from the intelligence people. And Oswald's obviously been trying to make people think he's a communist. Gets arrested and then goes on the radio as a Marxist. Any sign of Pilatus Maximus? she asked. No, I would say that man is a professional. We may never see him again. The New Orleans Trademark, said Patch, looking at another 4 by 6 black and white photo of the ruddy gray-haired Shaw. I don't know where the Trademark is. We'll have to check the map. She shielded her hand above her eyes as she looked around the park. Patch nodded as he too made sure no one lurked around her red impala parked across the street. Let's get some breakfast and then watch the masquerading Mr. Oswald at the Trademark. International Trademark Building, New Orleans, Louisiana, Friday, August 16, 1963, noon. As Patch backed the Impala into the parking space, Lee Oswald, in a short-sleeved white shirt and dark slacks, engaged in a heated conversation with a Cuban. They stood outside the open doors of a triangular tan building with green reflective windows tapering out in both directions. A row of international flags lined the rooftop. Oswald deposited a few dollars in the man's open hand. Looks like he's got a few people to help hand out those flyers, said Sherry. One of those men in the background was Carlos Bringier. Sherry clicked the camera button and photographed the dark-haired man. He shook his head and threw a bunch of the flyers into a nearby trash barrel as he abandoned the effort. Oswald returned outside and, with another man, passed out more flyers at the street corner. The passerby took the flyers but seemed confused by the content. Sherry snapped another photo of Oswald's associate, a slender guy in his early 20s with black hair and an olive complexion. Patch thought it odd that someone from a TV station filmed Oswald and his people down the street. He's sure getting a lot of publicity. Some distance away from the building, Clay Shaw, in a light suit, meandered down the sidewalk. Shaw! Sherry, quick, take his picture. Where? Over there. He's down the sidewalk. I see him. She pressed the shutter twice. Got him. Shaw entered the building around 50 yards down the sidewalk. Another player in the drama. How much money did they send this time, Patch? Fifteen hundred bucks. We'll put it in the bank with the rest of it. Pilatus was right. These people have their own purposes. I'm just not so sure what that purpose is, but it's damned important, and I don't think we can just walk away. Chapter 32. 4907 Magazine Street, New Orleans, Louisiana, Friday evening, August 16th, 1963. Another note from Pilatus at the hotel's main desk indicated that he wanted to meet Patch at dusk at 4907 Magazine Street in the city. A nervous Patch convinced Sherry not to take the Impala, and they proceeded on foot with a small notebook and the camera. 
He did not trust Pilatus or anyone else, and he had tucked the thirty-eight in his jacket pocket. Patch set up a position behind a telephone pole a hundred feet down the sidewalk and across from 4907 Magazine Street, a small duplex with a slight overhanging porch. As darkness fell, a car pulled up in front of the apartment. A Latin man and another guy walked up to the porch. Lee Oswald opened the front door and let them inside. I should have known. And obviously, Pilatus knew. Yes, I did, said a voice from behind. The man from Jackson Square, hair more dirty blonde, slicked back, wore a blue and white shirt with light chinos. He saluted as he approached from behind. Patch took Sherry's hand and backed up. Pilatus, I am he. He stared like a cat with crossed paws ready to pounce on its prey. The man across the street, entering Oswald's place. I'll call him Q. So what? Oswald thinks he's working for Castro. Pilatus shook his head. Not the case. He's anti-Castro all the way. Who are you? asked Patch. I wanted to meet you in person. I did some background checking on you through my contacts. Your file is classified, Kincaid. She lives in Spokane and taught sixth grade at the Corson Middle School until she left last year. I have no idea how you two linked up. Shari spoke from behind Patch. How do you know all this? Not important. Then who am I? Told you I can't access that. But I will tell you this. You appear to be following a man I've known since we were both in the service together in Japan. He's being used by multiple agencies. Primarily, he's an FBI informant, but he's deep with naval intelligence, the anti-Castro Cubans, the Direction General Intelligentsia in Havana, the KGB, the CIA, organized crime, and there may be more. It's crazy, but the main one is the student group DRE. They're being funded by the thousands from an intelligence controller. I will only give you his cover name, Howard. Why are they funding exile groups, asked Patch. Like everything else, to fight Castro or to make him look bad. If they had their way, an invasion would take place tomorrow morning at sunrise. Does Washington know about this, asked Patch. No comment. Your game, Kincaid, he said laughing. Lemon is sooner or later going to cross them or mine. I strongly suggest that you leave the city and disappear forever. He made a gesture with his fingers as if he were walking. Get out of this while you can, because sooner or later they'll kill you. Why? asked Patch, maintaining his distance. This Cuban thing is a menace. It's made killers out of patriots. It's brought out the haters like Bannister and Ferry. And they're in tight with the anti-Castro people you should be aware of. David Morales, Bernard Barker, Frank Sturgis, Arcasius Smith. Listen to me. Has a man named Pasqual called you? Pat shook his head. No, but I want to know what Oswald is really up to. Like I said, Oswald is being handled, used for propaganda. That's all right now. He moved down the steps until he looked into Patch's eyes. It's all in the name of killing Castro. I'm going to do my job for numerous people. Sherry spoke from behind. An impassionate speech for someone just giving advice. Pilatus did not smile and kept the same flaccid countenance. All I have to do is say the word, and David Phillips will have me put a bullet between your eyes. Is that what you want? Who is Phillips? He shook his head as if he were disgusted. Right. You're an amateur. Don't play games with me. There's somebody following us. What's that supposed to mean to me? A sticker with a number on it, on his binoculars. What's the number? He asked, pulling out a notebook out of his pants pocket. OP-921E2, and I have his tag number, 101-81939. What state? He asked, writing down the numbers. North Carolina, she said. Pilatus looked up quickly. North Carolina? Yes, 
The dealership was at Nag's Head, Patch added. Pilatus stared at him. He placed the notebook in his pocket. Do not send this information anywhere. You haven't, have you? No. Good. What is it? Pilatus said nothing more and walked diagonally across the lawn and then down the sidewalk into the dark. Patch took two steps after him and then turned to Sherry. He knows Sherry. The door opened at Oswald's apartment. Patch pressed his lips. We're going to walk lovey-dovey by that apartment on this side of the road. Okay. He put his arm around her as they ambled forward. They were directly across the street as Oswald accompanied the two men to their car. He briefly looked over at Patch and Sherry, but continued his conversation with the two men. We would be proud to have you join the Fair Play for Cuba committee. Just send your application back to the house here. Thank you said the dark-haired man. The car started as Patch and Sherry approached the next corner. Patch steered her to the right. The engine grew louder and the car continued down the street. Oswald climbed the stairs and closed the apartment door. What now, Patchy? We're going to get the Impala and check into another hotel, maybe outside of town. Agreed? I think this is very dangerous. I don't trust Pilatus. Maybe he has orders to kill us and is giving us a chance to leave. We'll stay away from the post office for a few days. And your file patch is classified. I'll figure that out. With no memory, she asked as they headed back toward the main road. That's a good one. Right. Now we know why Mr. Oswald is so important. Propaganda. He's being used for propaganda. Maybe. Patch nodded and looked back through the yards on Magazine Street. If what he said is true, then Oswald really doesn't know who he's working for. No one can balance all those allegiances without getting into serious trouble with someone. New Orleans, Louisiana, Saturday, August 17, 1963, 6.05 p.m. Patch sat next to a little table model radio. Sherry joined him on the couch. So, Mr. Oswald hits it big time on the radio, she said. Patch squinted with his fingers together in a praying position. He's on the radio for publicity. Well, I could think of better publicity than going on the air and telling everyone you're a communist. Patch looked up slowly. Exactly. The fact that he's a communist will be heard everywhere. Why? Why has he done anything he's ever done? I don't get it. This is the first in a series of Latin listening post interviews of persons more or less directly concerned with the conflict between the United States and Cuba. In subsequent programs, we will present talks with the people who are connected with the Cuban refugee organizations, people who are connected with President Batista, and United States citizens with direct states in the outcome of the Cuban situation. Tonight we have with us a representative of probably the most controversial organization connected with Cuba in this country. The person, Lee Oswald, Secretary of the New Orleans Chapter of the Fair Play for Cuba Committee. Patch raised his brows at Sherry. This organization has long been on the Justice Department's blacklist and is a group generally considered to be the leading pro-Castro body in the nation. So, Patch, why is Bannister's address on those pamphlets? Makes no sense. Sure it does. Oswald's trying to penetrate the organization. Or make them look bad. Young Lee Oswald was arrested and convicted for disturbing the peace. He was arrested for passing out pro-Castro literature to a crowd, which included several violently anti-Castro refugees. Patch pointed at the radio. Carlos Bringier? They make it sound like the 1917 Russian Revolution. He walked to the window, but turned when Oswald's voice came over the radio. For 23 years old, he sounded remarkably articulate. We have decided to feel out the public what they think of our organization and the aims and for what purpose we have, as you said, been distributing literature on the street for the purpose of trying to attract new members and feel out the public. Then what is he doing with the CIA guy, Shaw? asked Sherry. The whole thing is a sham. And someone called the TV stations? They were filming that thing at the trademark. 
Oswald certainly has his face out there now. Are you at liberty to reveal the membership of your organization? No, I am not. Of course not, said Patch, laughing. He's the only guy. For what reason? Well, as secretary, I believe it is a standing operating procedure that our organization, consisting of a political minority, protect the names and addresses of its members, and I have every, uh, uh, that, is, that is my duty and the reason that I do that. Patch returned to the window and looked over the iron railing toward the amusement park roller coaster. He sounds too good, like he's been rehearsed. I was just going to say that. He returned to the couch and listened to a detailed discussion by Oswald of the Cuban and Russian situation. Then he spoke of Ghana and the countries in Africa as he tried to skirt the issue as to whether Castro was really a communist. The host provided a barrage of reading and quoting for some time, yet Oswald answered as adeptly as someone at the State Department. Then he asked someone to write to the Times-Picayune newspaper's letters to the editor. He mentioned the TV station, said Patch, like he's garnering publicity. This guy's been rehearsed, sweetness. Listen to him talk in depth about Latin America. How does this average guy who worked at a coffee company know so much about the history of Nicaragua? Contrasting their agricultural system with Cuba? Patch stroked his chin at the window. I want to know who the hell Rosselli has linked us to. We'll have to figure that one out. They'll never tell us. Audio recording, three and a half inch reel, August 17th, 1963. This is Lemon. I am recording this tape in New Orleans. Lee Oswald again handed out his Marxist pamphlets. This time he was with two other men in front of the International Trade Mart in New Orleans. The intelligence operative, Clay Shaw, saw the operation from down the sidewalk. I have photographs on the roll included in this mailing. One man refused to work with Oswald and threw the flyers in a trash container after being paid by Oswald. The other man and Oswald continued to hand out pamphlets to all who went by the trademark. I received a note from a man identified only as Pilatus. It reads as follows. Mr. Kincaid, you are walking into something you best stay away from. I don't know you and have nothing to gain by telling you the people you are dealing with only care about what they want to accomplish. Sincerely, Pilatus. Later, in front of Oswald's apartment at 4907 Magazine Street, we met Pilatus in person. He warned me that Oswald was associated with numerous government intelligence agencies. He advised us to leave town. On August 17th, we listened to Oswald on WDSU talk in detail about his activities as the Secretary of the Fair Play for Cuba Committee, as well as the situation in Latin America. Lemon. Chapter 33. The Venture Motel, Pontchartrain Beach, New Orleans, Louisiana, Monday, August 19th, 1963, 1.15 p.m. Patch studied the ornate black iron railing along the second-floor balcony of the little hotel. Sherry held his arm as they skirted the grass and sand area, separating them from the entrance of the Pontchartrain Amusement Park. She read the pamphlet for the park that she had picked up in the hotel lobby. The entrance resembled a highway toll gate with a sweeping white wooden roller coaster towering over a smattering of little palm trees. Patch, this looks like a good place to get away from the surveillance and have fun. He smiled as he looked at the roller coaster in the sunshine. I'm all for that. His face morphed into serious as he continued his mini surveillance of every street corner and alcove all the way up to Lafayette Square. Near the post office, he approached a kid with his short hair combed back on the sides. He offered the truant teenager named Newton five dollars to enter the Lafayette Postal Street Annex and retrieve his mail from P.O. Box 300543. Then he and Sherry waited on a slotted park bench. He crossed his legs as Newton in his t-shirt and jeans walked up the stone steps. Pilatus is very clever, Patch, and we're just sitting ducks. I'm aware of that. Shaw is a problem, too. I think they're following him. You could be working for the Russians. Patch shook his head. Rosselli hates the Russians, and he's friends with Bill Harvey, and Harvey is an intelligence agent. Yes, he is, but I don't think he's involved with what we're doing. 
or Sully would have introduced him. Or maybe not. She opened her leather bag and slipped out the juicy fruit gum. She leaned the pack toward Patch. He shook his head. What about Oswald, she asked, putting a stick in her mouth. Face it, Patch. We're smacked in the middle of an intelligence operation. Pilatus dropped a name, Howard. Howard is the controller of a lot of people. I think Oswald is one person, and they have him either trying to piss off Carlos and his people or trying to discredit the fair play for Cuba thing. Our reports are worth it to someone who can shell out thousands, with Pilatus watching all this for somebody else. And him telling us to sit on this North Carolina information. Patch tilted his head back and laughed. Oh, what's so funny? Here you are reading those spy novels, and now you're in the middle of all this. She chewed and smiled. Real funny, Patchy, real funny. If we don't get killed, it should be pretty interesting. He looked up when Newton exited the post office with a vanilla envelope in his hand. Here he comes. Patch again looked around the park as he stood. Newton crossed the street and walked up to them. Anybody watching you in there, Newton? No, sir. Except the man at the counter. He was sorting mail. He handed the little key to Patch and then the envelope. Shouldn't you be in school, asked Sherry. What, are you a teacher, ma'am? As a matter of fact, I am, but not here. Oh, you have a phone number, Newton? Asked Patch. You ain't going to turn me in, are you? No, I just may need someone to go to that box again, and I'll call you. Sherry handed him a pen and her little notebook. You are a teacher, I can tell, ma'am. He wrote down his number on the page. Patch handed him five dollars. Thank you, sir. We'll be in touch. Newton held the five-dollar bill with both hands and then stuffed it in his jeans as he turned. He waved and disappeared across the park near the Henry Clay statue. That kid can't believe his good fortune. Patch ripped the manila envelopes corner. He felt more money inside, but he dragged out the typewritten yellow paper. We're going to a party. 601 Royal. Just says check for Oswald and his associates. Another 500 for us. They're getting stingy. And Oswald is on the radio again, Wednesday night, same time, same station. Do you see what's happening here, Patch? For whatever reason, Oswald's name, or I should say his notoriety, is getting out there. Maybe he'll head back to Russia. Or Cuba. They meandered around the park, but Patch still worried about being tailed. He looked over his shoulder at the park's pamphlet. Here, she said, placing the pamphlet in his hand as they sat on the bench. I knew you wanted to go to that park. Maybe. He ran his fingers over the map of the park. Ferris wheel. I like Ferris wheels. What about the Zephyr roller coaster, she asked. Patch grinned and panned the colorful flower beds. They have a German ride, the Wild Mouth. Sky ride looks good. I like being up in the sky. Then he imagined the horizon, the light, the blue sky, and the curved earth. 601 Royal Street, the French Quarter. New Orleans, Louisiana, Monday night, August 19th, 1963, 9 p.m. Patch parked the impeller away from the streetlight and behind an extended hedge. As Sherry read the Bond novel Thunderball under the glove compartment's light, he aimed the sound amplifier at the upscale light-colored house. An hour and a half had passed, but he had learned little of value. The party noise had messed up the conversation and political arguments between Oswald and the students inside the house. Around 10.30 p.m., Oswald, Ferry, and a few students holding drinks appeared on the iron rail terrace. The glow of the yard lamps and the interior light cast a milky glaze over them as they traded sharp words about United States foreign policy. There he is. She looked up from the book and leaned toward the headphone. Why are they so upset? Cuba is a hot issue. Patch pointed the amp toward the terrace and started the recorder. How many failures do we have to have before Castro is gone? Asked Oswald. Ah, they've tried to kill him how many times? For me, I would just kill him with cancer. Sherry's brow furrowed as she looked at Patch. Ferry's nuts. You know what Goldfinger said? Once is happenstance, twice is coincidence, and the third time it's enemy action. Patch thought about that for a second as someone in the background responded to Ferry. Why like killing with cancer would work. Go ahead, laugh. I have it on authority through the best doctors in the country right here at Tulane that injectable cancer can kill and will cause Uncle Fidel to expire.
like your mice? No, monkeys. You mutate the virus. I've written a medical treatise on it. Where did you get your doctor's degree? In the quarter? Patch smiled but was confused by Ferry. I've written medical briefs for Attorney Gill. Those mice had a stench keeping them in cages, killing somebody with cancer. Come on. You'll see when somebody actually does die from a cancer injection. A young, dark-haired woman took Ferry by the arm and led him around the corner of the terrace. David, what do you think of Dr. Sherman and Osher would say if they knew you were talking about a classified project? Ferry shook his head. What you don't realize, my dear, is Dr. David Ferry has spoken. Ferry seemed unconcerned about the warning. He walked back on the terrace. Near the door, he turned on one of the students and waved his hands as he yelled about Kennedy and the Bay of Pigs. Oswald stood back as Ferry, all the way back inside the house, called the president a traitor. Then the conversation blended in with the rest of the party. Oswald talked briefly to the dark-haired woman and they stepped back inside the house. Oswald so easily floats into the role he needs to play, said Sherry. I frankly don't think he cares either way, and... Cuba, it's whomever he's with. In his own little world, she said, Oswald is not suave and sophisticated, but he's smart and very clever. But killing with cancer? I think he has big ideas, Ferry. Patch recognized Oswald's voice again. He just said something about a Mr. Bishop to Ferry. Bishop? Who's Bishop? Patch shook his head and turned up the gain as Oswald spoke. Leopoldo to me and set up the whole Cuba thing. When do I meet Bishop? Do I look like the director of Central Intelligence? You'll know when you know. I protest your sarcasm. Oh, shut up. Patch lost their voices in the conversation. Sherry kissed his cheek. Are they done, Patch? Well, we're done here. Nothing new except Howard, the controller. Get to Howard and you'll find out who's controlling this whole operation. Or to Bishop. The Venture Motel, Pontchartrain Beach, New Orleans, Louisiana, Wednesday, August 21st, 1963, 6.05 p.m. Patch, the radio thing is about to start, she called from the bed. The Bakelite Philco radio had a speaker that produced a clear but resonating fidelity. Time for conversation carte blanche. Here is Bill Slater. Good evening. And for the next few minutes, Bill Stuckey and I, Bill whose program you probably heard last Saturday night, Latin Listening Post, Bill and I are going to be talking with three gentlemen on the subject mainly revolving around Cuba. Our guests tonight are Lee Harvey Oswald, Secretary of the New Orleans Chapter of the Fair Play for Cuba Committee, a New Orleans headquartered organization which is generally recognized as the principal voice of the Castro government in this country. Patch stood and slowly paced as Stuckey gave a background of the Fair Play for Cuba Committee. He mentioned the fight on the street and how Oswald was arrested. Then he talked about Oswald's marine background. You did live in Russia for three years. That is correct. And I think the fact that I did live in the Soviet Union gives me excellent qualifications to repudiate charges that Cuba and the Fair Play for Cuba Committee are communist-controlled. The Fair Play for Cuba Committee, as the name implies, is concerned primarily with Cuban-American relations. How many people do you have in your committee here in New Orleans? I cannot reveal that as Secretary of the Fair Play for Cuba Committee. You know, he handles himself well, whatever the hell he's trying to accomplish. Is it a secret society? No, Mr. Butler, it is not. However, it is standard operating procedure for a political organization consisting of a political minority to safeguard the name and the number of its members. Well, the Republicans are a minority, and I don't see them hiding their membership. Well, the Republicans are not. A, a, well, Republicans are an established political party representing a great many people. They represent no radical point of view. They do not have a very violent and sometimes emotional opposition, as we do. We? He, Patch moved toward the refrigerator. Coke? Thanks. He opened the bottles and grabbed a couple of glasses as Oswald and Stucky continued. Are you a Marxist? Yes, I am a Marxist. What's the difference? 
The difference is primarily the difference between a country like Guyana, Ghana, Yugoslavia, China, Russia, very great differences. Differences we appreciate by giving aid, let's say to Yugoslavia in the sum of $100 million or so a year. That is extraneous. What's the difference? The difference, as I have said, is a very great difference. Many parties in the countries are based on Marxism. Many countries, such as Great Britain, display very socialistic aspects or characteristics. I might point at the socialized medicine in Britain. I was speaking of, gentlemen, I have to interrupt. We'll be back in a moment to continue this kind of lively discussion after this message. I've heard enough, said Patch. What do you think? What I did before the show. He's playing both sides, and now he's up the ante with this exposure. This is a very delicate operation. I didn't think that at first when he was handing out those pamphlets. Patch finished the coke. You're right. Whoever's paying us wants to know exactly what Mr. Oswald is doing. 